So you want to pass exam BA, but you haven't yet mastered R programming. Perhaps you have some experience programming, but you've just never really sat down and learned the fundamentals. Well, fortunately, you don't have to be an expert at R to pass exam PA. If you have some experience working with Excel, with pivot tables, and doing some type of programming, whether it's SQL or SAS, or that regression course that you took in college where you might have used R. Well, fortunately, we are going to show you exactly what you need to learn and nothing extra. You'll be able to get up and running, writing your own scripts in seconds. You will learn predictive analytics. You'll be able to take data, transform it, remove errors and do all sorts of uh, cleaning and repairs so that the data will be taken from a a raw format into a process format that you can use for your actuarial models. You'll be able to answer all of the questions that PA throws at you. Uh, you won't need to rely on memorization techniques because you'll understand the basics well enough to come up to the answers yourself. The question isn't, should I learn R programming? It's really, uh, how much R programming do I need to know? In today's age, every actuary is doing some type of analytics. The more that you can understand, the better. We're going to teach you how you can, how explain, you can explain your results to other people. In this exam, which is really a communication exam, the most difficult part is interpreting the results and putting them into a non-technical language. You'll be able to take your graphs, make them look professional, and then explain them quickly. To get started, you'll need to download two pieces of software. First, you'll need R and you'll need RStudio. To download R, simply go to your browser and type in download R. To download R, simply go to your browser, type in download R, and then uh, you'll run this installer, which will put R onto your computer. RStudio is like Microsoft Word for writing R scripts. You could just use the text editor to write all of your code, but that would be very slow and tedious. To download RStudio, go to rstudio.com and then go to products, RStudio, and then select RStudio Desktop. Download RStudio Desktop, and you'll want to use the free trial version, uh, this version right here. It's not a trial version. The full version is free. There you go, download for Windows, or Mac if you're on a Mac, and then it will run on your computer. You can reproduce all of the output that's used in the study guide on your own computer. This was all made in RStudio. This chapter on R programming, for instance, is what I'll be going through in this. The files that you'll be using are called R Markdown files. They have the extension RMD. When you open up an RMD file, you'll see the following view. In the upper left, you can see what's called the notebook. On the lower left, you see uh, the console. On the right, you see this plot window, as well as a file browser. And then in the upper right, you see uh, the R environment. If you're just starting though, you won't see any of this output. Everything will be clear. If you wanna clear everything, you can click on this brush here to clear plots. You can clear this brush on to delete all of the saved objects. And in the console, you can press Control L. Okay, so on the notebook, you can see that there's a mixture of uh, text and code chunks. So the text is in what's called R, is, is in what's called a markdown language, which is basically a way of making HTML output uh, from your document. So if you press uh, this knit button on the top, it will take this entire notebook and make the output that you see from this chapter. So notice that there's some text here, as well as code chunks, and then the output from those code chunks. So that is what you see uh, on the upper left here. So for each code chunk, you can press this run button, and it will evaluate the R script that's contained there. And then outside in the R markdown, you can type whatever you want. So you can leave comments for yourself. If you're working on practice exercises, you can type out your, your answers to solutions and so forth. 
The basic operations of R are addition, multiplication, division, and exponentiation. These are just what you would expect. You can add two numbers together, you can subtract them, and so forth. The assignment operator is how you uh, give values to variables. Now, in other programming languages, you use the equal sign. So you might say something like x is equal to 2. Uh, you can do that in R, but it's not conventional. Uh, this is because the equal sign has a special use. It's used for the function assignment operator. We'll talk about that later, but it's enough to say that in R, you should use uh, this special assignment operator, which is arrow, left arrow and then this dash. The quick way to make this is to hold the Alt key and then press minus. So let's say X is equal to two. Could you see the keystrokes on the screen? Let's try that again. X, Alt, minus, two. So that stores a value of two uh, as X. If you want a real equality, you have to use a double equal sign. So if I want to ask, is four equal to two, it will either return true or false. You can also use uh, conditional statements, is 3.14 greater than three? That will be true. So vectors are arrays of numbers. They can be added just like numbers. The uh, C symbol that you use stands for concatenate. So let's say that I have two numbers, one and two. I wish to concatenate them together, so I use uh, C there. So X is a vector of one and two, Y is a vector of three and four. Can you guess what X plus Y is? You guessed it, it's four plus six. If you use a multiplication sign, it uh, multiplies them. So one times three is three, two times four is eight. Uh, you can do other operations on a vector and it applies them across every element in the vector, such as uh, exponentiation, division, uh, addition, and so forth. So what we've just been looking at are called numeric data types. There is also a character data type. This is the text or the string in R. Every string in R is either in double quotes or it can also be in single quotes. There's no difference. You can have vectors of characters as well. Uh, character vectors can be combined using the paste function. Let's say that I have these different uh, vectors A, B, and they are the quick brown fox. If I use paste, it will put them all together and uh, create a single character that's the quick brown fox. Factors are another data type. Uh, what's different between a factor and a character is that factors have only a finite number of values. So think of it like SQL. You have a text data type which can take you know, a free form, any number of values, whereas a, uh, a factor can only take a pre-specified number of values. Uh, this helps to reduce the size in your memory, and it's also useful uh, for predictive models because uh, factors can hold pre-specified information. So uh, let's create a factor that's from our character. If we look at the levels, uh, that tells you the different values which that character can take. Um, so the levels of this factor is just one, it's just the. The levels of a factor are by default in R in, alpha in alphabetical order. Um, so like, let's say I had this factor vector and it was you know the quick, the and quick, right? There's just two levels. If you look at the levels, it's gonna put them in alphabetical order. So quick Q comes before T. When you get to linear models, you'll see that this becomes important because the order of the factors matters. In generalized linear models, the reference level or the base level should always be the level which has the most observations. Um, so we'll cover this when we get to that chapter. The other type of data that we've already talked about is the Boolean. or This is also a logical, logical. data type. These can either be true or false. Um, so if I say bool true, I use the uppercase T-R-U-E. Um, I could also use the abbreviated uppercase T. 
If you multiply or add Boolean types, R will coerce them into zeros or ones. So if you multiply a true times a false, you will get a false, which is coerced to a zero. Booleans are automatically converted into zero or one values uh, when there is a math operation. So, you know, you could be, could be adding them together. Um, another useful trick is to take the sum of them if you have a huge vector and you want to know the counts. Um, so vectors work in the same way. Indexing in R is somewhat tricky. Uh, vectors are indexed using the square bracket. If you are only extracting a single element, you should use the double index sign for clarity. Uh, let's take an example. We have a character vector A, B, and C. If you want to get the first element, you use um, A. If you want to get the second element, you use index 2. If you want to get the, f the first and the third, uh, you use a vector, a numeric vector 1 and 3. If you want to exclude the second element, you use a minus sign. And you can also exclude a vector of elements. You can exclude multiple elements. The final, final and most and complicated most data type is called a list. Lists are arrays which can hold mixed types. <laughs> so what this means is that you can have lists of different things, right? You could have a Boolean and a character, character. and a numeric all stuck together into one list. So here's an example. This list uh, has three elements. The first is just true. The second is a character called character. And the third is a number. So lists can also have named elements. Um, so let's make some names here. The first, so you can see that it says bool, character, numeric. Those are the names. And then the elements are true character 3.14. So the dollar sign operator is a special way of indexing lists. If you use um, dollar sign and then the name of the thing in the list, you get that thing. Um, this is really similar to how dictionaries work in Python. So when you type this out, type out my list and then press the tab and then press the dollar sign. And then you see this autocomplete that comes down. So then you wanna use your keyboard and go up and down and then press the tab key on the thing that you want. So this is really handy when you have long lists and you need to quickly index them. So lists can also be indexed using the double bracket. If you wanna get the first item, that's just double bracket one, second item, double bracket two. Lists can contain vectors, other lists, or other objects. Now let's create a list that has a vector, and then a character vector, and then a list. Yes, that's right. We have a list that has other lists in it. So that's what you can see here. So to find out the type of an object, you can use class, structure, or summary. So if I type in class of X, it will just say X is numeric, or class of this thing, that's a list, or I can use structure of everything. This shows you the, the, um, the structure of the list. See, there's the first item, which is the vector, and the second item, which is a character, and the third item, which is this other list. And you can actually see that it's showing the, the, the structure of the, of list. the list. So uh, that's a really useful function also. And finally, there's what's called summary. So this just gives you a, um, another view. So it says there's three vector, character, list, tells you the length of each item and so forth. You only need to understand the very basics of functions, for example, PA. The big picture though, is that understanding functions helps you understand everything that you do in R. Because R is a functional programming language. That's a little That's bit a little... different than uh, Python, C, or VBA, or Java, which are all object-oriented languages. SQL isn't really a programming language, but it's a series of set operations. So this really will not apply to SQL. Functions do things. The convention is to use so you want to make your code as readable as possible, right? And the way to do that is to use a standard convention. Functions are verbs and objects are nouns or names. So if you had a function that was called make rainbows, 
that function would create a rainbow. If you had a function called summarize vectors, that function would summarize the vectors. Now, technically, you could name your functions anything, right? I could name my function t or s or f of x, right? Um, but that would not help to make the code readable. If you need to do something in R, um, there's probably someone else who's written a function to do it. That's why it's such an easy language for beginners to learn. You don't need to write your own code from scratch. You can simply find a function that someone else has written to do that for you. So let's just create a basic function. This is going to be called greet me, and it's going to take in a single argument called my name, right? And notice that there's no return statement in this function. You technically could use an argument here called return, but it's just a formality. It, it doesn't change the result. So if you call uh, greet me and then you say future actuary, it will say hello future actuary. Um, you could also you know, be really specific and say my name equals future actuary. And uh, so this is a case where you actually use the equal sign, because this is a functional assignment operator, is what it's called. You can have functions of multiple inputs. So let's make add together, which takes in two arguments, x and y, and then it will add them together, right? And you could also use the return statement here, uh, which would do the same thing. So uh, we mentioned that binary operations in R are vectorized. In other words, they're applied element-wise across the vector. So let's say that I had two vectors, x, which is one, two, three, y, which is four, five, six. If you add together these two vectors, you get uh, one plus four, which is five, two plus five, which is seven, and so forth. Many functions in R actually return lists. This is why R objects can be indexed with a dollar sign. So you'll see this a lot. Um, let's take an example. Let's say that we fit a simple linear model and that's saying that uh, charges is the dependent variable and another variable called age is the predictor. Okay. You don't need to know all of that, but if you just looked at you know, the result of model, just type in model here, uh, you know, it returns some stuff, right? It says this call and then this coefficients thing, okay? Well, this is actually a list. So the first, so that if you want to just the coefficients, you just use dollar sign coefficients, like so. You can also use functions that return lists. Let's take something called sum multiply, tricks in x and y, and then first it sums them together and then it multiplies them together. And it's gonna return a list of, two, of those two things, right? So let's say the result is sum multiply of two and three. So if you, if you want just the sum part, that's five. Just the product part, that's six. You just looked at the you know the whole result result you know that would be a list of two things data frames are the table or the spreadsheet in r this is the very very important to you to understand for exam pa because everything that you do is working on data so you can think of a data frame as a table that is implemented as a list of vectors so let's say that we had you know this data frame right here and it has two variables, age and has FSA, right? So if you look at this data frame, this will say that the first item is it has age 25 um, and has FSA true. The second is age 35 has FSA true, right? You can also work with what's called tibbles. Now, a tibble is what everyone what ev uses. The data frame, data frame is actually the outdated version of the, t of the table. Now, you don't need a history lesson. However, uh, R is a very old language, and the data frame object is outdated in several ways. The tibble is a much newer version, which has a number of advantages. Number one, when you uh, print out the result of a, uh, a tibble, it will only show the top five rows. However, if you print out the result of a data frame, it will show like 200 rows. Like, um, yeah, so if you like type it into the console, like right here, this is just a data frame that I typed into the console, right? And it says, I'm sorry, this is a tibble. And see how it prints this nice thing? Uh, it only shows the top, top 10, 10 rows 
and it like looks really nice. It even tells me what the different data types are. It says the first column is a double, the second column is a character, right? It's like a spreadsheet. But if I were to convert this to a data frame, say I want this to be equal to uh, as data dot frame patient length of stay, and then I um, print this out. <laughs> Look at how this how prints this out to the console, right? It's just a bunch of gibberish. Because it prints out like a hundred rows of each of the variables. Yeah, and it doesn't even tell you what the data types are, right? So whenever you work with data in R, you should use tibbles. You shouldn't use data frame. For PA, you're gonna see that some of the code that they give you uses data frames. Um, that's unfortunate. It's just because not everyone not every who uses R thinks that way. And uh, some code is just was written a long time ago and people have never updated it, so it still uses data frames. So you should work with uh, tibbles because they're easier. So we said that data frames are basically lists, right? Well, if you want to index a list, you use the dollar sign. So let's say that I wanted to um, index you know, just the age column. I just use df dollar sign age. If you want the, uh, the dimension, the number of rows and the number of columns, use the dim argument. To find a summary, uh, use the summary function. So this for numeric variables will tell you the min, the first quantile, the median, the mean, the third quantile, and the maximum all from just one function. For uh, the other data types, it will um, also give you uh, the summary information. So, a pipe operator might look confusing at first, but once you start using them, you will never be able to go without them. Uh, this is a way of making code modular, meaning that it can be written and executed in incremental steps. So those familiar with Python's pandas might know this as similar to the little dot operator. Um, this also makes code easier to read. So let's take an example. Right, you're an actuary. You should be able to know what this math is saying. I take log square root square. exponent log two square root max three, four, 16. What's the answer? It's one. Isn't that obvious? Getting the answer of one requires starting from the innermost nested bracket. All right, and then moving out from left to right, I have to say, okay, uh, I have a vector 3, 4, 16, the max of that is 16, and then the square root of 16 is 4, and then the log base 2, et cetera, et cetera. You get really dizzy, right? And it's the same thing when you look at the math, right? It, you have to start on the inside and then go to the outside. Um, so a much more convenient way of doing this is to use um, the pipe. So the pipe lets you write the code in the order that it's, you read it. So you say, take the max of these, and, and then take the square root, and then take the log base two, and then exponentiate, and then square root, and then log, like that. So um, if you want to translate this into English, just replace the pipes with thens, right? So you look at this, this is beautiful. It's almost one-to-one -one, um, in English. The max of three, four, and 16 is 16, the square root of 16 is four, the log and base two of four is two, the exponent of two is e to the two, the square root of e squared is e, the natural logarithm of e is one, right? So pipes are exceptionally useful for data manipulation, uh, which is covered in the next chapter. This is when you have to you know, combine queries together. Like in SQL, you might use like a select statement and then a where condition, and then a, you know, a bunch of other stuff, but you basically stack all of your code together into like one little argument. And that's what the pipe does. It allows you to put all that together. So to quickly produce those pipes, um, use a keyboard shortcut, control, shift, and then M. So when you're evaluating, you can also just you know, take piecewise bits, right? So if I want to just evaluate, you know, the max square root, I just highlight those two and then hit control enter. If I want to evaluate the log, the log part two, hit control enter. So I said at the beginning of this video that um, you don't have to be an expert in R to pass exam PA. And that's absolutely true. Um, you'll even notice that the, uh, the template code that they 
they give you and they ask you to edit, you know, doesn't expect you to know deep pipe. You don't need to know what these pipe operators are at all. However, there are some advantages to uh, learning this style. One, it will save you time if you're doing anything in R. It will help you in real life data science projects. Uh, the majority of the R community already uses this style. The SOA actuaries who create exam PA uh, will eventually catch on. And most modern R software is designed around the use of pipes.